Thank you.
Greetings, Destiny family. We are excited to honor our founder, Bishop Glenn B. Allen, during the month of June. Church family, if you have been blessed by his daily messages, if your spirits have been uplifted by his kind words, if our bishop has done anything that made your day better, this would be a great time to sow a seed of love. His cash app is displayed on the screen, dollar sign Glenn B. Allen 1. Destiny family, we look forward to honoring our bishop all month long. We love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Give him praise if you know that he's your hope, and he's Christ in you. He is the hope of glory. Therefore, we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to be afraid because he is always with us. He promised he'd never leave us. He promised that he would never forsake us. So our hope is in you, Jesus. Our trust is in you, Jesus. Thank you for being our strength and thank you for being our joy. And thank you for giving us the victory. Right now, somebody just say, I have the victory. You're not even saying this to your neighbor. You are declaring, I have the victory. Say it again, say, I have the victory. Now come on and say, I'll never be defeated. Say, I will never be defeated. the victory this morning there's a smile on my face because I've got the victory it doesn't matter what things look like all around me I've got the victory hey the devil is a liar God is exalted never be defeated never be defeated the devil is a liar Never be defeated, never be 
shall never, never be defeated. Come on. And because God is the greatest power, say we shall never, 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 say I shall never. Good morning, beloved. It is my divine pleasure to come to you again on a glorious Sunday morning. I know that you just enjoyed the praise and worship by our praise team. What a wonderful, wonderful time we're having in the sanctuary. I know if you're viewing us at home, you're missing this. It's got to be something that you're missing. I praise God that you're watching us online, but man, there is absolutely nothing like being in the sanctuary. This morning, I want you to buckle down, get yourself prepared, call your friends, share and uh, like this broadcast today, share, make sure that you subscribe to our, to our YouTube channel, make sure that you are sharing this word with everybody you know. But let's get ready for a powerful, powerful word. I know God's going to bless you. Tune in now. Let's hear the word of God. Look at someone and say, maybe in the right place at the right time. God bless you. Let's get right into the word. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And Jesus, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Once you look at your name, wave at me. Can't touch them yet, but just wave at them and say, Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. Y'all said that so casually and cavalier. Say it like put some force behind it. Say it again, don't be distracted. Last week we celebrated Memorial Day. And when authorities have reported that holidays are the most dangerous time on the road. There's an exuberant amount of people who travel especially during the summer months. And because of the congestion of traffic, the risk gets higher and higher. People travel to see their family, their friends, they go on vacation. The news reports 
says that over 20 years ago that the cause of many fatalities on the road was caused by drunken drivers 20 years ago. But today the cause of so many accidents are not drugs or neither alcohol, but it's something called distracted drivers. You may have heard of those people. You may be one of them. You know what a distracted driver is? It's driving and doing something else. You've seen them on the highway. People driving and. Isn't driving enough to keep your full attention? Doesn't driving require enough of your attention? But distracted drivers drive and. Some people drive and text. Some people drive and answer emails. Let me know when I get to your streets. Some people drive and eat their lunch. Some people drive and engage in a romantic moment. <clears throat> Some people drive and have a heated conversation. Some people drive and FaceTime. Some people drive and look at Facebook while others are driving and ordering something on Amazon. <laughs> or even worse, some women drive and put on makeup. Eyelashes, <laughs> lipstick. <laughs> Studies show that what makes distracted driving so dangerous is that there are moments that you ought to be focused on one thing because you can't only you can only think of one thing at a time. There was a time when corporal tunnel syndrome was a major concern. But our young people have uh, developed something else. And the pain leaves their wrist, shoots up their arm, and ends up in the back of their neck because the whole day the hand is like this and the head is like this. Looking, I said young people, but some of these old people are the same way. And their thumb is constantly doing this. And they got a new diagnosis for it. They call it text neck. A pain in the neck from texting. Doing too many things at one time. I pass all this on to you not as a lesson on driving or even a life lesson, but a lesson on discipleship. There are moments that we all need to be focused on just one thing. Paul said, this one thing I do. I'm putting these things behind me, not multiple things, not trying to handle a plethora of different things. But I'm handling just one thing. I want to be productive. I want to be, I want to be fruitful. I want to be uh, successful. So I want to put my focus and my energy on one thing. That's a, bit, a pretty big challenge, especially because we live in a world that places a premium on being able to do more than one thing. As a matter of fact, if you are applying for a job and you tell them you can only do one thing at a time, they probably won't hire you. Am I telling the truth? Well, some of y'all haven't applied for a job, you don't know what I'm talking about. One of the attributes that's attractive is your ability to multitask. In other words, an employer is more likely to hire you if you can do more than one thing at a time. 
Your proficiency is most times measured by your ability to get multiple things done in a day. The quest, the quest for many millennials is for them just to stay busy. Have you noticed millennials can't hardly sit in one spot for too long without getting antsy, nervous, bored? Hello? They can't watch a total movie without getting up and doing something else, getting on the phone, looking at a game, checking Facebook, Instagram, calling somebody. Their attention span is this long. They have a severe case of ADHD. They're bored with things that don't keep their attention. This is why they keep doing things. They can't ride in a car without turning on music. Now, I'm going past young people now. They can't ride in a car without getting on the phone because they don't want to hear their own voice speak to themselves. They may have to talk to themselves for once in their lives and they drown out the conversation with making sure they put on music and keep something that keeps them engaged with something else, somebody else's voice, because I don't want to face the reality of my own life, so I'd rather listen to somebody sing about a life that I'll never have. Go get that money. Go get that honey. Why are y'all looking at me like that? Why can't you ride in your car without anything on? It's bored. We went on vacation last year. While I was relaxing, I decided to take my children with me, but they complained, we're bored. I said, well, this is not your vacation, this is mine. You're just a tag along. And you're here for free, you're not paying for this. So I don't care if you're bored or not. Then after all, then I was outvoted and you know, I got outvoted. And I'm gonna say it again, I got outvoted and I ended up at an arcade, a place that's not made for people my age. <laughs> Playing skee ball. I'm driving a car that's not going anywhere. Spending money on worthless tickets because people are bored. Even the media has adjusted to accommodate this lack of attention to one thing at a time. If you go up in my day, the news only had one anchor. One anchor. One person you saw, like Walter Conkright. Y'all remember Walter? Tom Brokaw, who reported the news for an entire hour. Now, y'all pay attention to me now. Don't talk while I'm talking. See, you're getting bored already. (laughs) Now you got a whole panel of people. You got three or four people on the screen in different locations, different sites, remote locations. Plus, you got the sports uh, scrolling at the bottom of the screen, the ticker tape on the side of the screen, flash news on this side of the screen, because everybody is inundated with all kinds. They can't keep their mind on just one thing anymore. Engage in the whole screen at one time. All of this is because man is a multitasker. He's distracted. You'd be surprised that multitasking didn't come into the English vernacular until the 1960s. It's a word used to describe, to describe a, a computer's ability. Now we use that word to say that we can operate just as, as efficiently doing multiple things like a computer. I can do things like a computer. I can do more than one thing at a time. Well, you can never do more than one thing at a time and be good at those two things at the same time. 
This is why we get half job. We get half work done. We get half things done because nobody's putting their all into anything. We get half cooked meals, half clean houses, half an education, half a marriage. Y'all gonna talk to me today? You know I ain't scared of y'all, right? You do half a job or your job and demand a raise at the end of the week. We only work 20 hours when you were there for 40 because you can't stay focused. You're watching the clock. You just got here. You just got here at nine and you're ready to go to lunch at 10. You go to lunch for two hours and come back and ready to go home. Counting the clock down, man cannot stay focused. And there are days when you got to be able to do more than one thing at a time. There are days you've got to put yourself in multiple places. We talked about this last week. Women are especially ingenious in this particular arena. You've got to be able to juggle food and family and friends and sometimes foolishness. But there are moments when God requires something different from you. Sometimes he just wants you to quiet the hustle and the bustle and just focus. Somebody say it with me, focus. Now come on with me to Bethany. We've been here before. We've been here before. We've been here with Lazarus. We know the story of Lazarus. Now let me introduce you to his two sisters, Mary and Martha. The Bible gives an account that they're living in this same space together, but it makes an identity. This may be Martha's house, because Martha gives the invite to Jesus. Here's a single woman, we don't have an account that she's married. Here's a single woman that's housing her brother and her sister. What am I saying to single women this morning? A single woman who has her own house. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, all right. It's so far-fetched to you. Here's a single woman that is not married yet, but has a house, and she's housing her brother and her sister. Oh, but she does something marvelous. She invites Jesus to come dine at our house. You got to understand, whenever someone thought about inviting Jesus to the home, there had to be a special type of preparation done. And that day, it was customary if you had a special guest coming over, it was known by the preparation. Your host, the preparation that you made for that, uh, that to host that person really indicated how important that person was. So can you see Mary and Martha scurrying around there? Trying to get the food together? trying to get the house clean, what would you do if Jesus was showing up to your house today? Could he just come over? Oh, come on now. I mean, come on, the way you left it uh, this morning, the way you left your house this morning, could he just show up, pop up, and say, I'll just wait until you cook? I mean, is your house in order for him to just pop up right now? So we see that they had to get the house in order. Now in verse 39, it says, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. And as they prepared, something happened that shifted the atmosphere. Martha noticed that Mary had disappeared. Where is Mary? She was just helping me mop this floor. She was helping me get this food together. Where is she? Just sitting here at the feet of Jesus. But Martha kept on preparing. And the Bible says, look at the word the Bible uses, she was distracted. 
She got caught up with what Mary was doing. Can I tell you something? So many of us, we can't do a proficient job doing what we're doing because we're so busy looking at what somebody else is doing. I really could do a better job at what I'm doing, but I'm not staying in my lane. I always want to do what somebody else is doing. Can I tell you, nobody can do things like you do it, like God called you to do it. I want to license somebody today to stay in your lane. Can you just wave at somebody and tell them stay at your, in your lane? Just because you got a great voice to sing doesn't mean you've been called to preach. And just because you've been called a preacher don't I mean you've got a voice to sing. And just because you've been in church for a long time don't make you the boss. You're not rule over people. You've got to learn to stay in your lane. Martha kept on preparing. The Bible says she was distracted. And the Greek word for distracted is persepio which means that she was overoccupied, simply means that she was getting the job done, but she was a multitasker. Verse 40 says, she's distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, does it seem unfair that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come here. Come on. Help me. Now, let me get down to the meat of this scripture. Y'all ready for some preaching? Okay. I've been preaching all the time. Listen. When you look at the text historically, Mary is in a place that women were not supposed to be. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And this place was reserved for folk who the rabbi taught. Essentially, it was for men to learn and then go home and teach their wives. This is why Paul said, women, keep silent in the church. If you got anything you need to know, ask your husband when you get home. I'm teaching him, he's going to teach you. But the problem is, it's gotten so backwards, the men are not learning anything, so now the women got to learn. And now you wonder why your woman acting like a man because you've given up your position. So now it's no problem with Mary sitting here because she can't get no man to teach her. So I'm going to go directly to the source. I'm going directly to the source. I've been waiting on somebody to tell me something about Jesus, but I ain't got no man to teach me, so I got to go to him for myself. And let me tell every woman here today, if you don't have a head that can teach you, you better learn to get to Jesus. For yourself. Listen, Martha was doing what was also traditional. She was cooking and cleaning. And also traditionally, the text is taught, when we look at this text, we teach the tension between outward service and inward worship. Outward service and inward worship. The contrast between worship and doing work is most times shown as a separation of two personalities, but the truth is that they're working in tandem with each other. Oh, can I explain it to you? See, one promptly follows the other. Truth is, Martha you got your orders wrong. You should have been worshiping first and working after you worship. See, the working is in tandem. Listen, you, Mary's not lazy. She's sitting here so she can get her anointing in order, so she can get her power in order, so she'll know why she's doing what she's doing. We got too many people working who have never worshiped. I got folks in here right now, you hold positions, but you've never lifted your hands. You've never given God glory. Yes, you work, you work on the yard, and you sit here and hold doors, and you work around 
come to church, but you won't lift your hands and give God glory. You got it backwards. You got it backwards. That's why your work is always half done. You got inward. See, you got to have inward worship. It should always precede your outward service. See, we're trying to put our hands on what we put, what we haven't put our heart in. I need to say it again. You're trying to put your hands on what you haven't put your heart in. That's why, you know, you can do it when you want to do it because your heart really ain't in it. You can pick and choose when you want to do it and who you want to do it with, what day you want to do it on because your heart really ain't in it. So you got your hands on something, but your heart ain't in it. Let me try to show you what happens when you got your hands on what you haven't put your heart in. You remember when they would bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem? First of all, they were carrying the Ark the wrong way. They, they, they God told them to put some brass poles between the brass rings, but they got lazy and decided to put it on an ox cart. And then, as they were traveling, the ox stumbled. <laughs> the ox stumbled, and Uzzah put his hands on the, on the ark, and he died. Because it was never intended for them to carry it on an ox cart. It was not for the, the burden was not for the ox, it was for their shoulders. God said, I want you to feel the weight of this thing. See, you ain't got no worship because you ain't got no weight. You ain't got no glory on you yet. You ain't, you ain't got nothing on you yet. You got to be able to carry this thing. And you let, the, you let yourself get lazy and do it in another way. God says, now when you put your hand to it, it may take you out of here. Your hands are on what your heart is not in. <laughs> Oh, I knew this message was going to be tough here today, but Jimmy cracked corn and I don't care. <laughs> I, got to, I, I, I neglected to preach this last week. Lord said, don't you, go, don't you go to church another Sunday, don't preach this. You got too many people want to do the work and never worship the God that they work for. Consequently, there is no relationship. You're just doing a bunch of religious work to be seen of men. But when you really know who you're working for, you don't really care if nobody sees you. My name don't have to be on the program. You don't have to give me a little lofty title. I'll work behind the scenes that God may get the glory. Can I get a witness in here today? Somebody lift your hands and say, God, you get the glory. You get the glory. Jesus said it like this. It says in Matthew 15, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Then he tells us again, no one who puts his hand to the plow and turn back whose heart is not in it is fit for the king. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand folk who told me that you were called to preach, profess that you were called to do a work of God and now your hands ain't on it no more. That may tell me that you were really never called to do what you said because nobody can really be called to do anything and then go back to do it. You're not fit for the kingdom. I know y'all don't like what I'm saying, but if God ever call you to do something, he don't call you to start it, he calls you to finish it. I wish somebody here, he won't just anoint you to start it, God will anoint you to finish it. God is anointing finishes in here. God. Yes, man, yes. Over these 40 years, you think I haven't felt like turning back and said, I, I'm done with that. I'm done with these black folk. I don't call y'all that. 
You think I haven't felt like that? But guess what happens? The same thing happens to me that happened to Jeremiah. Yes, yes. I, when I start walking the other way, fire comes back. I said, uh-uh. It's like fire. What I said I wasn't going to do no more. It's like fire shut up in my bones. And you got to have something that makes you do what you say you wasn't going to do no more. Take your hand off of what your heart ain't in. I'm going to say it again. Take your hands off of what your heart ain't in. Is this too much? I hope it is. We leave out here shouting and still ain't serving. Ooh, you preach today, Bishop. Ooh, Lord, you preach today. My God. But you still go live like hell afterwards then I really didn't preach. If I don't preach something that rattles your cage or gets up under your skin, then I haven't preached yet. Well, get ready, because I'm getting ready to preach something that's going to get us fit for kingdom living. Here's the truth of the matter. No one should serve who hasn't sat. If you're serving and you haven't sat at the feet of Jesus, you don't know who you're serving. Lord, I got to worship you first. Yeah, I watch people, man, be all outside in the vestry, out there doing everything. And they want to put their hands to God's work. I wonder, you know, you, you, your agenda's all wrong. Your agenda's all wrong. Now, let me go ahead. See, let, me, let me read this scripture. I'm going to be finished with it. I'm going to let y'all get out of here without being in jail. <laughs> and then Jesus said, but the Lord said to her in verse 41, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing we're being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary discovered it. Only what you do for Christ is going to last. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you got your focus on the wrong thing. You distracted doing all this work. You forgot to worship. You forgot to sit down and get a word. That's why I don't care how much you you work, your work ain't going to work your faith. Only they going to work your faith is the word. Well, Lord, I, I round that clean the church up. The Lord said, yeah, I heard that, but what were you when the word was going for? That's why you don't have any faith. And I don't understand folks that just stay away from church forever and think you're going to get fed. Man, that's a different experience even being in this house than being online. You getting a fresh word from the kingdom. I want you to think about this today. As we go out through this week, I want you to spend some personal time in worship. Lord, let me get to a place. Man, I saw you, man. What a wonderful band. That was powerful today. I'm going to live to see it happen. But I'm going to tell you all something. If y'all can't do that at home, you ain't got nothing. Well, look, beloved, I know that word just bless you, but there's a decision you got to make today. Now, I'm going to tell you, man, after hearing such a powerful word and knowing that decisions determine your destiny, I need you to make a decision for Christ. Now, there's a number at the bottom of the screen, and today... You can text him one or three words. One word is saved. That means that you don't know Christ and you want to meet him for yourself. But if you text that word and someone's going to contact you today and explain to you the plan of salvation. Secondly, if you text in the word connect, that means that you want to be a part of our church. You want to be a member of this wonderful church called Destiny Christian Center International 
where I am your bishop, Bishop Glenn B. Allen. And man, what an honor it would be to be your virtual pastor. Then thirdly, if you want to be a part of our daily devotion, you can do that today by making sure uh, that you just text in the word daily. And that means I'll get a word out to you every day to encourage and get you started in a victorious, a victorious day every day. Also, you want to make sure that you are joining us every morning for our prayer line. The number's there, and the password is there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, make sure you join us for prayer and join us uh, as we touch and agree every morning at 714 a.m. Prayer warriors, people who need prayer, whatever the needs are, God meets us when we pray together. Now listen, let's get ready at this particular time to worship God in our giving. It begins with your tithing. It begins with you understanding that that tent must be taken off the top, given to God first because it is holy unto the Lord. Now God says, listen, I can't trust you with a tithe. What can I trust you with? God says, I'm going to open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. Do you believe even in this time where God has proven himself time and time and time again uh, that we still don't trust him with the tithe? The Bible tells us to prove me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. God said, listen, I've been doing my part. I've been giving to you, opening the windows, providing, sustaining, and here it is, I'm still proving that I'm a provider, I'm a sustainer, I'm a way maker, but now it's time for you to trust me with that little dime on every dollar. Now today, I want to challenge you uh, to make that move, make that decision today to get back to tithing. And then you want to make sure you're giving a good, good seed in the kingdom. Now you can't make it here to the church, but certainly there's our obligation as a family to make sure the church is financed. It's financed. We need to make sure that these bills are paid and uh, the payroll is paid and all of our expenses and, of course, to keep the lights on, so many things. And so we, we give to make sure that the kingdom is financed. But also we give a seed in the ground. And when you sow good seed, God says, I will give you an a bountiful, a bountiful, an abundant harvest. Now today, I want you to remember this. If God can't trust you with a seed, he can't trust you with a harvest. So today, make sure that you are giving to God like he's been good to you. I'm going to say it again. Give to God like he's been good to you. Lastly today, covenant partners, I need to make sure that you are, are standing on your vow to God. And that is, we're going to cancel these debts. We've already canceled a couple of them. We got a couple more to go. And as we do this, our aim and our goal is to be debt free. Now, I know we can do it if we do it together. Not an effort made by one or two people. If we all pool together, we can do it together. Now, I'm looking forward to debt free living in this church. And guess what? It's going to transfer from this house to your house. Praise the Lord. Now get ready, start praising God right now for the wonderful blessings that are getting ready to come your way. Thank God for it today. Now, uh, until next time, I want you to know this. For me and my family, we love us some you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. We'll see you next time. Greetings, Destiny family. We are excited to honor our founder, Bishop Glenn B. Allen, during the month of June. Church family, if you have been blessed by his daily messages, if your spirits have been uplifted by his kind words, if our bishop has done anything that made your day better, this would be a great time to sow a seed of love. His cash app is displayed on the screen, dollar sign Glenn B. Allen 1. Destiny family, we look forward to honoring our bishop all month long. We love you and there's nothing you can do about it.